And our, on our, our keynote that we have uh, invited up here to speak, to open us up here, I've heard it many times. As uh, in my graduate classes, uh, they use him and it, it's, he's just like an unreal being, you know, just kind of, flow, he just pops up and floats all over and people write papers. If you quote Leroy Little Bear and cite him in your paper, you're gonna pass. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a guaranteed. So there will, you know, Marie Batiste is the same way as well. You know, I quote her and Marie, and then that's an eighty guaranteed. You yeah, know, nah. <laughs> but um, you know, I I I want to I want to say that we, uh, he needs no introduction, uh, my friend. He knows he needs no introduction. He's come here wanting to share these words and share this wisdom with us. And I'm very, very honored that he accepted uh, that phone call and that uh, internet tobacco and made his way over here. And uh, I want to let him introduce himself in the best way that he knows how. Because our introductions, I can go through a long list of that, but I'd like to let him get as much time to speak to each and every one of you as possible. So with that, please help me in welcoming up our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Leroy Littlebear. Okay. Nistuan na kog, ikas kiniwa, inaksiks, kainal, sao kitapiu, kene nuhtu tsitapi. As I tell my audiences, I was just speaking to you in Mongolia. First of all, I want to thank our elders for their wonderful words and their prayer. And I want to recognize the people whose territory we are, traditional territory we are on. And I also want to thank Chris and all those people that were involved in Bring it about this gathering so that we can all talk to each other about the theme and the name of the conference, Think Indigenous. To uh, start off, when we're talking about Think Indigenous, I want to just preface my uh, presentation with a few Blackfoot words. And I, I want to say that I'll speak from a Blackfoot perspective because that's what I was brought in. And I know what I'll say has, you know, quite you know, similar to our other Plains cultures. But before doing that, we, uh, we've been talking in the academy about indigenizing our institutions, our schools, our universities and colleges. At the University of Lethbridge, we've been doing that for the past 40 years. And it's gotten to the stage where the University of Lethbridge has its own Blackfoot name, Iniskim, named after 
the uh, sacred buffalo stone, Ammonite stone, that are very sacred to our people. The University of Lethbridge also has its own honor song. And its honor song is sung along with the national anthem at convocations and other official gatherings. So as a welcome from our territory, I'd like to sing the University of Lethbridge honor song. I want to talk about identity. And whenever I come to somebody else's territory, some, sometimes I have an ID problem. This morning, I looked in the mirror, and it looked the other way. We all tease each other between tribes and so on. They tell us that before, and just about the same time, that human, you know, homo sapiens, humans, appeared on this earth, there was Neanderthal man. Yeah. Well, I jokingly tell people, we used to text Neanderthal, you know, but where is he now? Well, the thing is, especially here in Saskatchewan, with all the potash mines around, Neanderthal must have smoked quite a bit for there to be all that potash, you know? <laughs> And see, we're going to do it again now. <laughs> Saskatchewan just came out with their plan for cannabis. And just think of it. Our descendants will be saying the same thing. Those guys must have smoked a lot for there to be potash 100,000 years from now. I want to talk to you about identity and land as a basis for our identity. I uh, like to get our tech people to come on. The, uh, a lot of times we don't think much of it but it plays a very important role. Uh, <clears throat> let me... I don't know. Oh, there we go. Identity is a sacred responsibility. 
identity is, multi, is a multifaceted uh, concept. Individuals use a large aggregate of criteria to define who they are. The criteria, the criteria may include, but not limited to, things like personal names, family, religion, national, nationality, race, skin color, specialists, and language. It may even include hearing, seeing, politics, events, and the land. All societies, at one time or another, when they first come into being, Sooner or later, a society will claim a territory. And within that territory, a culture arises from all the mutual relationships it has with the land. A culture consists of paradigmatic concepts, values, and customs. Paradigms are the tacit infrastructures. And what do we mean by that is that tacit infrastructures are those foundational bases that are the foundations of our thinking processes. And those foundational bases often are so embodied in you that you don't even have second thoughts about them. In fact, many of us will have a hard time to articulate those foundational bases, but yet they form the very foundations of your beliefs, your identity, how you do things, and so on. Okay. The, uh, <clears throat> To be knowledgeable about culture, one must have a good understanding of those paradigms or metaphysics of a culture. And if one is to, uh, if one is to transfer knowledge to children, paradigms and metaphysics are the foundational basis of a society's way of thinking, beliefs, behavior, customs, and values. Let's look at the native paradigm. And I'm a major proponent because for the most part, we don't go very deep when we're talking about indigenous ways, especially in education. We don't go very deep, but if we were able to examine at a deeper level those paradigmatic bases, those metaphysics, you will find that that's what we need to inculcate into our students, into our young. My wife and I, along with Marie Sagic and a few others, have been talking about this native paradigm for, for a long time. But one of the foundational bases of native thought is what we refer to as flux. What do we mean by flux is that in the native mind, everything is always in motion. You know, never, nothing is ever at a standstill. And the example we use, we use jokingly is try and make a, try and make an appointment with a Blackfoot, and he'll say yes. We'll meet at two o'clock. 
But if I'm not there, I'm over at my grandma's, you know? If you don't see my horse over there, I'm over at my uncle's. See, it basically means, hey, things change all the time. And with tongue in cheek, sometimes we get asked, three, three years in advance to come and speak at a conference. And we tell them, sure, we'll do it, but call me back the week before, you know? <laughs> See, we never know what's going to happen. See, that's because things are always in motion. Now, you think about Western ways of thinking, everything is fixed. And the best expression, the bumper sticker for it is Einstein, who says, God does not play dice with the universe. Say, everything is static. So that's a big difference in Native and Western thought. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the next part of the Native thought process is that we think in energy waves. Waves, in, in native thought, we think in energy waves. In Western thought, it's all about matter. In subatomic physics, they talk about particles, see? But we think in energy waves. And in fact, the energy waves we talk about are really the spirit what we refer to as the spirit. Now, in our ways of thinking, everything is animate. In fact, in Blackfoot, there's no such thing as inanimate. Everything is animate. Everything has a spirit, see? Whereas in Western thought, in English, let's say, yeah, you and I may be animate. Those animals might be animate and so on. But we start to stop when we come to the plants. If a non-Indian talks to their plants, they'll never tell anybody else. Because they'll think, oh, this guy's crazy, you know? So, whereas, I was trying to talk to the trees over here this morning and they wouldn't respond because they didn't understand Blackfoot. You know? <laughs> yeah. So in other words, hey, our languages allow us to speak to rocks, trees, plants, and so on. Yeah. So that's a big difference in the paradigms, in the ways of thinking. Yeah. Our next process, in the native thinking process, is that everything is related. It's all my relations. When we're talking all my relations, as our elders in their prayers said, hey, we're not even talking about humans. All my relations is that universe out there. The trees, the rocks, the stars, the sun, so on. Those are all my relations. So, whereas in Western thought, hey, we may start out broad, but we come down to a single point. Very reductionist way of thinking. And when we come to the point, hey, that's the right way. That's the right answer. That's the reason why in classrooms, there's only one way, there's only one right answer. There's only one right way of doing things. Whereas in native thoughts, hey, you can, you can climb the mountain from different angles. And when you get to the top, you all have the same vision. 
See, there's different ways of doing things. Yeah. Uh, in native thought, everything requires renewal. Okay. Whereas in Western thought, the best way to put it is been there, done, did it. Say. In other words, if I ask, if I'm in grade five and I ask a grade three question, the teacher will tell me, you should have known that in grade three. Get with the program. Okay? Whereas in native ways, hey, we do the same ceremonies. We sing the same songs. We tell the same stories. And as I jokingly say, we even tell the same jokes now. And everybody knows the punchline. We still have good laughs about it. We renew things. See? It's about renewal. Okay. So, a big difference in ways of thinking. Yeah. The, uh, our uh, next uh, frame, if we can move it, and sometimes this doesn't work. In native thought, we're about place. And we may wander away from that place, in other words, our home territories, but, hey, we always come back, okay? So, because of place, we usually have only one home. In Western thought, land is not the reference point. In Western thought, time is the reference point. And so I can be at home in Toronto, I can move, and I can call, call Vancouver home, say. In Blackfoot, ways of thinking, yeah, I'm a visitor over at those other places, but home is always where I was born, where I was raised. And the next part of it, the paradigm, of course, is the language. The language acts as a repository for the knowledge that's contained in our, in our cultures. So let me give you a couple examples of that. One of them is a very simple saying in Blackfoot, and that is, in English, if I, if I uh, translate it, best translation is, I'll lay down, I'll lay down. In Blackfoot, we would say, that's just tukits. Well, when you really examine, that's just tukits. What it really means is, has nothing to do with laying down. It says, I'm going to make myself thin. Now, if you go back to the paradigm with regard to energy waves, it begins to tell you, if I make myself thin, those energy waves won't hit me as, you know, readily hit me anymore. Say, I'm going to make myself thin. Say, very different from English thought. Say, in Blackfoot, we say imitao. Imitao refers to, if you just ask a Blackfoot speaker, what does imitao mean? Imitao, he'll say, oh, that's dog, okay. And a res dog in this case. 
And, but again, when you examine the word imital, it has nothing to do with dog. What it really is saying is it's a being, a spirit of some kind that's on the move. But see, because of the flux notion, we never know what it'll, it'll turn itself into, but for the time being, it's appearing in its anthropomorphic form. Say, very different. In Blackfoot, we say, tsanita biu, in other words, a, an expression that we would uh, that's somewhat equivalent to good morning, how are you? Well, Tsanita Biu, again, Blackfoot speaker will translate that to how are you? But what it really means is that that little ending up B has to do with the energy waves, it has to do with movement. And those energy waves are connectors. So just like you can use the word for the, the term rope, uh, this. And the thing is, the best translation for tanita biwa, how are you? In Blackfoot, it's really asking, how are you connected? very different from saying, you know, the normal expression. So those are, you know, language that was mentioned this morning is a very, very important part of thinking indigenous. Yeah. For Indians, land is a very important part of identity. For Indians, the ensoulment of the land is a web of relationships with the earth, animals, plants, inorganic matter, and the cosmos. It is captured in the stories, songs, and ceremonies. For David Abram, events happen somewhere Events belong to the place, and to tell the story of events is to let the place speak through the telling. Okay. And that's why we don't mark our territories with meets and bounds, as they do in the survey system. We mark our territories with sacred sites and each site has songs, ceremonies, and so on. When you go there, that's what you sing. That's the stories you talk about. That's how we mark our territories. Okay. Yeah. Lane is a very important referent in the minds of native peoples. The land is mother. It cannot be separated from the actual being of Indians. According to Greg Kahete, Native people express a relationship to the natural world that could be called ensoulment. The ensoulment of nature is one of the most ancient foundations of human psychology. And soulmen must be passed on to the younger generations. So that's what we as teachers, that's what we need to instill in our young, in our youth. Yeah. From the above, one can conclude that it is the place that determines who you are. And waters, 
observes American Indian identity and worldview, a history of place consciousness preserved through oral history, manifests discrete geographic place symbols within conscience, consciousness that provide a con conceptual framework of uh, identity as place. American Indian consciousness and hence American Indian identity is cognitively of and interdependent with our land base. A loss of native identity is the loss of the stories, songs, and ceremonies that happen at certain places. So, native, native people, native identity loss comes about when the land doesn't recognize you and you don't recognize the land. In other words, have you ever been to a place everybody talks about and excited about and you go over there and you say, it doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. Say, that's a loss of that ensoulment of the land. What does all this mean for us, teachers? It means that you have to bring up our children in a cultural atmosphere that best resembles the land where they come from. That is, where our children come from. The land is their identity. You, as a teacher, should know the songs, the stories, and the ceremonies. Yeah. If I were to resurrect in 200 years from now, will I be among strangers? Will I hear my songs, my language, my stories? To be Blackfoot means I have to live by the teachings contained in those songs, stories, and ceremonies. It means I must be able to transmit those teachings to the younger generation if my Blackfoot world is to continue. So, land, we talk about it, but deeper, it's much more important than we usually accord it. Yeah. Because colonization, because of colonization, many of us have bought into the idea that indigenous knowledge has nothing to contribute uh, to the larger field of knowledge. But if we just look a little bit deeper, we discover that in many fields, people are just beginning to find out about things that our elders know. Let's look at a few of those things. In science, Einstein caused a revolution in science because he said time and place were the same. same. Well, in Blackfoot, that's old hat. Yeah. We knew that all along. In economics, everybody's talking about sustainability. Hey, our whole approach to, you know, our ways of doing things was ecological balance, harmony. In psychology, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know that Maslow talked about his hierarchy of needs. He never gave credit to the people that he got it from. He got it from the Blackfoot. 
Yeah. He, he knew, he, that's what he was taught by the Blackfoot. And when, so when he's talking about those hierarchy of needs, I don't mind talking about those hierarchy of needs, but I don't think the Blackfoot told it to him in a hierarchical manner. It would have been more holistic. So notions of physical needs, security, love, self-esteem, and you know, self-actualization, all those were Blackfoot concepts. One thing he did not include, and he left out, was what I would refer to as transcendence, and that is spirituality. He didn't include that, but I'm sure the Blackfoot talked about it. In law, hey, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized our oral history stories and so on. In relationships, hey, we can, we can deal with complexity. Whereas in Western thought, they talk about it in terms of efficiency, but really what is meant by efficiency in Western thought is treating everybody the same. So we can deal with complexity. Why? Well, come back to that paradigmatic base, the flux. Same. So for us, that's, that's a natural. Yeah. The, uh, our babies must hear Blackfoot sounds. Those sounds are sounds of the land the sounds of the environment. Hearing those sounds connects you to the land. Events happen at a place. Telling the story of events is allowing the place to speak through the telling, as Abram says. For instance, the Northern Plains had buffalo roam over it. The buffalo was part of the plains Blackfoot, in turn, had cultural connections to the buffalo. Our sacred societies, some of our ceremonies, our stories, songs, are very closely connected to the buffalo. In fact, we have tongue twisters and so on. I'm trying to teach to my granddaughter. In Blackfoot, we have a saying, if you can picture a herd of buffalo coming towards you, and the clucking of the hoofs, so on. We have a tongue twister for that. And it goes like, See, talks about the clucking of the hoofs as a herd of buffalo comes towards you. Yeah. Our babies, our babies must see the land, not just concrete. Our babies must smell the plants, not just the poisonous smell of refined sugar. Our babies must taste the berries, not just Big Macs. Our babies must touch the land, the bark of trees, not just toys or rocks. If we're going to have them 100 years from now thinking indigenous, that's what our babies need. So we as parents, as teachers, that's what we must pass on to our young, to the youth. Yeah. So, 
The land has many, many different spirits running over it. Our babies must become one with those spirits. Remember the flux, the energy waves that constitutes the flux are the spirits. The near extinction of the buffalo resulted in a large part of Plains cultural cultures disappearing. Why? Because we are not using our best education resource, the land. But the buffalo is coming back. Our cultures are reawakening. Our babies are the ones that will carry our life ways into the distant future. That's why our sacred bundles, our babies are, sac are our sacred bundles, but give them their identity to toy. We must give our babies that identity toy. What's that identity toy? Hey. It's the land, and it's right there, say. It's right there. As our elder said, our universe is right there, say. That's what we need to give to our babies. So starting today, let's all do that. Thank you. All right, you can't leave yet, all right? We have, uh, we have a gift for you on behalf of, uh, uh, I think, Indigenous, on behalf of our conference. But I have to run way over there where they put my table, then run back. So I need you to stand here and look handsome.